So once again, thank you for joining this session. So I think hope you had a time to go through the, the lecture series series that was uploaded on the NPTEL web page. Uh, so I, I will be just you know summarizing some of those concepts, and I will request you guys to you know kind of interact during the course during the course of you know this this two hours so that I can gauge on key how 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 well you are trying to get it. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not like a formal teaching session. Let's, uh, I would like to keep this as more like an informal one on one conversation. So feel free to interrupt me anywhere or drop a message in the chat box because I'm watching the chat box for you to answer. Okay. Uh, most of you might have heard of these interactions, right? How these interactions. What are these interactions and how ecological interactions are important to understand different species? Okay, so there are multiple types of interactions. So here they're shown in different color shades, like the one in greens, which talks about mostly positive interactions between two different species. And there's a neutral neutralistic inter neutralism, which talks about which, which doesn't have any positive or negative, it's just neutral interactions. And uh, negative interactions where at least one of those individuals has you know negative effect as a result of the interactions okay uh, so can you can someone talk about mutualism or this want to talk comment about one of those interactions like either mutualism neutralism or I mean citizen, anything so Or describe what you are seeing about the mutualism. Someone. Yep. Guys, please do respond when I ask for questions so that, yeah. So, in mutualism, if you can look at it as, you know, Okay, helping each other to survive. Yeah, that's one that's a you know shorter way to put each keep it. So it is an interaction if you should talk with respect to the table. There are two species, let's say individually, or it can be either between individuals. Yes, as she said, mutualism, both organisms get benefit, absolutely right. And then most of these mutualisms, each of these organisms help each other to survive in those conditions, harsh conditions, mostly. Uh, so if you look at in terms of you know this plot you have individual a or species it can be either between two different species or it can be between the same species but different individuals so one can be the donor one can be the recipient of the interactions at least in the positive interactions in mutualism you know both of the recipient and the donor have positive outcome due to the interactions like both of them get benefited from the interactions while as in commensalism, only one individual gets benefit, the other doesn't get, neither gets any benefit nor is lost due to the interaction. Because just it's just part of the interaction. While in neutralism, none of them, you know, gets either positive or negative benefits. While amensalism is, you know, exact opposite of commensalism, where one of the recipient is negatively impacted the other doesn't have any any positive or negative ben uh, benefits to it while in antagonism one individual is negatively in affected and the other individual is positively affected so like the case of predation where the animal the, let's say for example tiger predates on a cheetah so the tiger gets you know positive benefits out of the interaction while the cheetah has negative impacts of the uh, interaction similarly while in competition both of the participants or the uh, recipients in the interaction are negatively affected because each of them has something to lose because of the interactions uh, so I'm let's 
see what what are some of some of the examples of each of these interactions in you know look like uh, can someone say what sort of interaction is this so what so let me explain what the picture is it's a cat, it shows a picture of a cattle aggregate with you know cattle or cows grazing in the background so what kind of interaction is does the cattle and the cat cattle aggregate have here out of these interaction matrix we have looked at which which intra which interaction can we classify this as positive interaction mutualism okay and any more answers because there are at least eight twelve of you there so expect most of you to answer or uh, all of you to be please put up your answers in the chat box or unmute yourself and try to speak up your answer in different detail if possible only just one answer uh -huh. anybody else wants to answer it Okay, then I will take it as a no and then go ahead uh, with Rajshree's answer. So Rajshree, uh, you are right that it's a positive interaction for sure, but it's not a case of mutualism. Because if you look at this matrix, for, mutual, for mutualism, both of the individuals have to be, you know, positively affected from the interaction. But here, only the cattle aggregate gets benefit while the cattle doesn't receive any benefits or you know any negative impact due to these interactions like so this will this is a case of you know commensalism okay so what happens in at least in this example is where the cattle aggregate it tends to follow these cattle or buff buffalo or cows whatever you can you see here they're trying to follow them when they are grazing. So as these cattle move around, so they will be disturbing all those insects that are present in the area, which are flushed out. And it, it will be much more easier for these aggregates to follow them and then catch them rather than you know search for them individually. Okay. However, for it has to be the case of but these things can survive without interacting. So you can see cattle, just the cattle grazing anywhere, somewhere without aggregates following them. And similarly, aggregates can be found, you know, foraging near near water bodies with when there were no cattle nearby. So this, this represents an example of commensalism, not mutualism. So coming to mutualism, you know, mutualism is the symbiotic interactions where both or all individuals benefit from the interactions. Okay. So it can be considered obligative or, or facultative. So Applicative is like, like you have said earlier, someone has said earlier, that it's absolutely necessary for their survival. Without the mutualist interaction, both of the partners in the interaction will die out. While in facultative, it, it will, you know, help those individuals, species can survive independently, but being part of the interactions will have much more positive effects for their survival. Okay, can someone think of any examples for mutualism, either it could be obligate or facultative, that you might have heard of or have seen? Hermit crab and sea animal. Okay. Clownfish and animals. Okay. Uh, so, hermit crab and sea animals, which kind of mutualism it will come under? Simultaneously, clownfish and animals. Can hermit crabs and sea animals survive without each other? If 
if you would like to answer answer or, or else no okay what about clownfish and animals okay so let me start answering with hermit crab and, and sea animals so it, it's one of uh, it's one of the you know beautiful examples that you get to see in uh, marine ecosystems uh, it is a case of mutualism but it's not obligate mutualism it's more like a facultative mutualism in case of hermit crabs and sea animals because her you see hermit crabs without sea animals that can you know do well and sea animals also in the same as aspect do well but when you have hermit crab and sea animal together they receive each of some sort of benefits from each other like hermit crab receives extra protection while sea animal gets to you know move around get lot of feed from different areas or disperse itself but they can sustain themselves without the other partner so it's a case of facultative uh mutualism while clownfish and animals uh so what happens in this interaction is clownfish gets protection absolutely right from any due to animal because they have these stinging cells and the predators will not come around and what animals receive is like when these clownfish move around swim around these the animals they get aerated so they can get fresh water so and, and they can be you know fresh in those aspects so it's a case of case of mutualism uh but i'm not exactly sure whether which whether it will belong to obligate or facultative mm. if you go by the definition if both of can survive you know without each other then that has to be facultative but i'm i'm more kind of thinking that it might be obligate mutualism but this i'm not really sure uh uh if i will i will request you guys to please look it up after the class so that you know you can be sure about it or i can also look at and let you know at the end of the class okay uh let's look at up some other examples okay uh can someone describe what we are seeing here at least in the pictures so this is one of the rare few examples which not many of us have heard of so i'm trying to bring some, those sort of examples which are really interesting can someone describe what is what you are seeing here in the pictures since you are talking about mutualism it's a case of mutualism but yeah what is it ants with some leaf yes ants are carrying leaves uh so you might have heard of these ants called leaf cutter ants that cut down leaves and transport in a line to you know to the nest so this is an ant how an individual ant looks like and this is a trail of ants that you know are carrying leaves back from a tree that they have you know cut down and taken back to their nest so these ants are leaf cut ants but they are found in you know amazon rainforest not most most of the leaf cut ants are from the americas american regions so what's so interesting about this so is it something with respect to ant and the leaf no so the reason why they are taking the leaves is they, are, they will take down the leaves to their nest they will chew down the leaves and they will whatever they have chewed they will dump it into a pile which has a fungus so that fungus digest the leaves and then these and grow itself and then these are ants harvest the fungus and feed them themselves and then their and once with this fungus or so without the fungus they can't survive and the fungus can't survive without the ants and so this represents one of those beautiful case of mutualism even at the tiny level okay so this is how the fungus looks like once it started devouring the leaves and then there are there is absolutely beautiful way how ants and this fungus fungi communicate with chemical signals and some ants are solely responsible for tending chewing
in those leaves and then putting up there so that the fungus can grow and some different workers tends to harvest them and some workers are responsible for bringing, bringing the leaves so there's a clear division of labor, labor that you see here okay and there is you know this is a proto cooperation is also you can also think it as an example of uh oblique um, facultative mutualism kind of uh both the participants benefit from the interaction but they can survive without the interaction also and the interaction is not obligatory for the survival of both the participants if you are watching the lecture uh where there is the example of an oxpecker which is a bird and then a mammal mostly these these birds are commonly found in africa but here you see in india you see, tend to see some other species so what this interaction is these birds generally come and sit on the mammals and then pick off the ticks or some other insects and mammals in turn get the benefit of you know removal of ticks so but they can survive without each of them separately also but when they have come together uh ox pickers get a beautiful spa and then sorry impalas get a beautiful spa and ox pickers get to have free food or much say easier food uh while on the left side is a very interesting case is an example of ants and aphids where you know aphids can stay uh themselves they can breed and grow but under ants they receive much more greater protection from predators or parasit parasitoids so and what does ants get in return they get they whatever the leaf aphids or leaf hoppers excrete after feeding on the plant which is, which is much more sweety sweety sweeter for ants they have they collect that and then use it as food so both of them gets the benefit from the interaction and how and similarly both can survive without each other okay and coming to the amensalism part of the interactions uh see if you, if you go back to the example of you know the cow and the cattle and the cattle agret uh, instead of cattle agret let's bring up the insects into the picture uh let's say when these cows are grazing so they are neither getting any benefit uh, and and if you talk with respect to the insects cattle and the insects the cattle is getting no benefits from the insects being around there but when the cattle is grazing around there the insects are getting exposed and they are getting predated upon so that interaction where the insects are receiving a negative effect of due to the interaction and the cows are neither benefited nor harmed is an example of amensalism okay and there are many other examples let's say for uh, if you think uh, you might have heard of algal blooms that happens you know where vast amount of algae suddenly grows sometimes in over, overnight and then spreads across these water bodies either it could be lakes rivers or oceans so the algae gets you no know, but then the fish that's that is living in inside those waters you know gets most of them die because of the toxins produced by this high amount of algae that have grown okay so since the fish are negatively affected and algae doesn't get positive or negative uh, as benefits from the interaction so it, it can also term this as amensalism and competition can someone talk about competition uh, what what do you call what is a competition can someone just describe what do you think is competition fight for prey okay that's that's one thing fight for prey and
anybody else wants to add for mating too yes you are right fight for prey fight for mating i guess you are not just talking about the pictures but fight for territorial areas okay you have described what the pictures are depicting and can can someone add something else other than what those pictures are depicting okay it's a rivalry between two organisms for a common resource yes that that's kind of summarizes you know what all other people have said earlier so it's 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 an interaction where both of the organisms interacting engage in in some sort of you know uh we can call it as rivalry or anything uh where they they, they fight for a common resource the re For, you know nesting place it can be a fight for anything but it majorly involves common resource which both of those organisms tends to you know claim uh, as you can uh, that, that is what I tried to depict in these pictures uh, so competition can be between intraspecific and interspecific okay it may be exploitative or interference competitions. Please give examples. Okay, I will come to it in the next slides. So, yeah. Intraspecific and interspecific. Can someone wants to say what, what what's the difference between intra and interspecific? How are these two different? Individuals of same species. Okay, then inter individuals of different species. Yes, uh, yeah, that's right. Intraspecific is intra means same. Specific is refers to you know species. Okay. So specific refers to species. Similarly, inter between means between species if the competition is between you know individuals of the same species for either for whatever resource mostly that happens for you know uh, food territories mating rights mostly but there are other cases that happens for a lot number of reasons and interspecific competition can also happen for the same reason or I men ha happen for different reasons also okay So, coming to the, uh, you know, uh, interference competition, exploitative competition, and apparent competition. So, so, there are many number of ways the competition has been classified into. So, let, let's just go over each. Okay. So, if you look at this plot or whatever the diagram, think it, you know, C means it's a competitor or it can be an organism. And R depicts resource. And then P is for predator. Okay. Then C will be a prey for the predator. Okay. There are three different kinds. Let's for interference competition, both of the competitor competitors has to interact directly. Okay. With each other for it to be referred to as interference competition because they're interfering with each other for, for that for whatever resource. Okay. While in exploitative competition, there is no direct interaction between them, but they interact indirectly through the resource. Okay. Uh, like, for example, it can be, you know, feeding a lot on some of these grasses. One species might, let's say, for example, if you take the example of Cheetal and Samba, if they feed on the same, same area, so it can have, comp they, they can compete by eating the same sort of resources. So then in that case, it can be called an example of exploitative competition. So generally these two are termed as real competition, while there is another type of competition called apparent competition, 
where the competition happens between two different competitors because they are a common prey for a different predator. Because here the predator is, you know, is responsible for the competition that is happening between these two organisms. While in exploitative competition, there is a common resource that you know that go that talks about how how these two species will compete okay and interference they compete directly okay so coming to examples you guys only identify what do you think is this uh, this hard be hard beast law competing for territories depicts which kind of competition either either it is interference exploitative or the third one, interference. Anybody has any other ideas or agree with interference competition? Okay, so Yes, since these two are interacting directly, it's it's a case of interference competition. So what 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 about the second picture, where an eagle and a fox are interacting over a common resource, rabbit, a parent? Okay exploitation exploitative exploitative okay so let me just go back to that so uh it's not apparent if you remember both the competitors are interacting through the prey competing for the prey in, in that aspect, so that's how competing between themselves. Uh, so this can be an example of, you know, exploitative competition. In, in theory, it can be a case of exploitative competition, but at this aspect, it also represents, you know, direct slash interference competition, where because they are, you know, directly involved in the interaction. But if you see a fox hunting for, let's I think it's a rabbit, fox hunting for rabbits at a point and you simultaneously see the eagle hunting for rabbits then you can you know say that it's exploitative competition but when they are doing it together it represents you know a case of uh, interference competition because they are interacting directly there but if they do it separately it can be exploitative so you are right there partially right there but yeah so, in this source, compete for same prey and for apparent competition. Can someone think of some examples at least? Think of Indian Indian forests. Think with respect to Indian forests. Can someone think of what an apparent competition example looks like? Uh, which one? You didn't text understood the exploitative competition example. So I was saying, okay, apparent competition. Okay, if so, anybody understood, if you have, if you think of any example, please write that example or tell us about the example so that you know. I can help you understand it a little better. If you don't have, I think I have to make up some example. It will be better if you have your own example so that you know you can have better understanding. Predator, tiger, competitors, chital and samba. Yes. Okay. So can you, Harsha, can you please uh, talk about how this is an example of apparent competition? Can you just speak or write in the chat?
the example is a very nice example but can you please help others understand or should i just go over it so how tiger being a creator mediates chital and some okay uh, so i had the same example which is like yes tiger is a common creator for these two chitals and sambar so what happens in apparent competition as you can see from the example the predator has directly you know affects these two two different individuals in the interaction two different species or and then these two species are indirectly competing to not be here for survival from the tiger okay uh, it can be for survival it can be for you know resources uh, if, if a tiger tends to eat you know a lot of chital the competition for sambar you know is reduced for food for, for, for sorry uh, for feeding areas if you know tiger tends to you know hunt more sambars the chital can you know go around aramsay and then it can feed in those areas where sambar doesn't go because there's tiger there if it tends to you know prefer one so it kind of you know reduces competition between these two because it feeds on both of them or preference if it has preferences it can thus alter the competition in those aspects so when a predator mediates the competition between two different prey species or competitors that type of competition you can call it as apparent competition okay but they are not interacting directly between themselves okay hope that was clear is brood pa parasitism is a kind of competition it's abaratna uh, in the in the name itself it's there right is brood parasitism a kind of competition can you just if you think it of brood brood is what you call is for juvenile or you know young ones generally tend to call brood for some organisms parasitism it specifically says if the interaction is a parasitic interaction so it can't be competition but there are exceptions which i will come slowly but this is it's a it's a case of parasitism it's there in the name itself right i uh, hope that answer was convincing okay if you're not convinced we can we can have a chat in the end okay uh what sort of interaction do you think this is so let me actually explain the figure that you are seeing here these are called epiphytic plants or basically bromeliad specifically these these plants grow on top of other tre trees in the in mostly in tree forest so so they are exposed to you know sunlight they get rain all of them and then they have this high vantage point so that you know they can grow there so what sort of interactions do you think it is between this epiphyte and rainforest trees parasitism okay any more any more any more so i think what sort of interaction someone said it's parasitism the someone else some else someone else has any, any other thoughts what would it be okay so okay i will i will comment about your answers is tropical cascade related to apparent competition okay let me just finish this up and i'll just try to answer it to you a little later after this is done so this is also a case of commensalism 
the thing about this is so it can be a case of parasitism also but if they are just sitting there if they are not they are acquiring nutrients on their own growing on their own without you know harming the plant then it's a case of commensalism but if they are harming the plant like some epiphytic plants you know ha ha extract nutrients from the host by sending their roots inside the tree bark so that will be a case of parasitism so some of these bromeliads are represent a case of commensalism where they get get to you know ex uh, exposed to sun so which is a positive inter advantage they receive from this interaction and then the host tree doesn't get you know any sort of or negative or positive interaction okay means there are some epiphytes that are parasitic and if you see a picture you can either it can be either competitive commensalism or parasitism okay uh is, is tropical cascade or rajeshri are is mean to trying to say it's trophic cascades related to apparent competition if it's trophic cascades okay uh i don't think uh it it i don't think it's it's a it's a case of you know it's not related to apparent competition at all because trophic cascades you have to have you know all the individuals at different levels like you know you have a predator let's for example the tiger the cheetah and the grass okay there are multiple trophic levels you study not just two trophic levels so where if you if you happen to have one of those members in the trophic web levels removed or reduced in number so the other gets to you know expand or and simultaneously there is this effect that just goes down okay for example there has been this nice work that has been that has been published from iisc which looked at you know the impact of wind turbines on uh, rock agamas so the main wind turbines you know reduces the number of kites or the raptor birds that feed on this prey so simultaneously as that is reduced there there are a you know, lot of number of individuals of these agamas that you know or that that grow in number so there is this you know shift that happens so but apparent competition is little different so tropical trophic cascades are a little different so for trophic cascades there has to be you know multiple trophic multi trophic level that that you have to do you have to have. and can plants be parasites yes there are lot of plants that are parasites and much of these parasitic plants are helped by birds uh, you might have heard about this bird called flower pecker they are one of those chief culprits that helps in you know spreading this parasite at least in the indian subcontinent but there are other birds also because these plants produce these beautiful colored seeds roots and seeds once these animals these birds gulp, uh, eat them and then these birds tend to sit on trees mostly trees so when they sit again on those trees and then defecate the seed once it has passed through the gut is ready for germination so wherever this bird goes so it just keeps on spreading those parasitic plants and then the parasite plant once it grows out of the seed it just sends its roots under the bark and then forcefully extract nutrients from the host tree and then there are many beautiful parasites there are some parasites that are specific to cactus cactuses okay hope uh, things till here were clear If so I, I will move forward okay i will take it as a s in this case and what do you think this picture depicts here which type of interaction does this picture depicts
predation yes ah yeah you're right so here is a snowy owl predating on some duck species so predation is one such interaction which most of us tends to observe in our day-to-day -day life it can happen you know between individuals of same species to across species or across taxonomic groups like a bird which is a vertebrate feeding on uh, a dragonfly which is an invertebrate so there, there is huge in, huge web of interactions that once get one get to see uh okay can someone explain what this picture depicts and what kind of interaction does this is this picture depicting about so let's start with what are what are the things that you're seeing in this picture we'll go to the parasitism okay are uh, you you are saying grasshopper okay there is one grasshopper another what is so this is a grasshopper I agree what is this it's a nematode is it a worm yes it's a nematode and all of you together answered it uh, so it's a grasshopper that is infected by this nematode and it's a case of parasitism okay so the way the this intra this parasitism happens is these once uh, you know, these grasshoppers gets infected by one of these nematodes. Uh, when the nematodes are, you know, were in very small stage, the nematodes they grow inside the grasshopper. They grow till they grow this much large. There can be multiple. There can be few in one or one individual also. Once they have grown to the full size, they alter the behavior of, you know, the grasshopper, which doesn't, you know, generally go near to water that much to jump into the water and then die once it jumps into the water these nematodes or these worms they come out and then finish their cycle their their, their life cycle and then again go back into you know once they mate there they will again go back into grasshoppers so uh the the nematode belongs to this genus called nematomorpha okay it's a cricket so parasitism as we just discussed occurs when one individual especially a parasite benefits from another individual the host while harming the host in the process so if one is receiving the benefit one is receiving a you know negative one is losing from this interaction so uh, parasites can be, you know, ectoparasites and endoparasites. Endo means inside, ecto means outside. Outside the if, if the parasite, you know, is present on inside the host body, then it is an endoparasite. Ectoparasites are they stay outside, like most of the ticks, lice, fleas, bed bugs, all these can be classified as you know ectoparasites while tapeworm, worm, all these worms that stay inside, malaria, uh, plasmodium, falciparum, yeah. all these are, you know, endoparasites. And this is another example of ant from, you know, neotropics, basically South American regions, so South, uh, South American tropical regions. So, so on the left, you see is a normal ant. How does it looks like? And to the right is an ant that is infected by a parasite. Both are of the same species. Just see how the black gaster, this is called gaster, becomes bright red. Okay. So what happens here is. So these are three
get in on their way with so if they end up feeding on one of the bird droppings where from where they get the nematode in the first place the nematode is mermesone nema neotropicum saying it's specific to ants from neotropics and once the ant is parasitized it will grow inside the stomach which is this region of the ant and then once it grows to its size and then it wants to finish its life cycle it it makes the ant abdomen red so this ant is also behaviorally altered so it's kind of you know walking dead individual so it raises its gases so that it becomes you know bright red and any bird that happens to see that this is bright red it's like you know it's easy to spot behind the green leaves and then it just goes around and is the ant once inside the body of the bird the you know the nematode happily reprodu mates reproduces and then again comes out in the form of droppings and then whenever a next new ant new ant is goes forages from the bird dropping it gets infected so this circle again goes so sometimes most species uh, some species of nematodes are just single host to come finish of the cycle or parasites but some species you know in, involve multiple hosts so there are similar examples of you know snails also and most of you might have heard about this zombie fungus which you know takes control of the brain and then kills the whole organism there are you know a lot of movies and games made with respect to you know inspired from this fungus so this fungus attacks most variety of insects not only just ants there are spiders there are crickets there are every every taxonomic group gets attacked by most of these and if you have heard of this thing uh, called himalayan viagra it's basically this genus of fungus that has a pactic caterpillar from belong from belonging into the himalayan region so those once they form so those are what it's collected so those are indeed paras those are parasitic fungi yes uh, yeah one of the games and movies the last of us has been made with respect to this zombie thing it's present even in india so it's not like it's specific to region it's present all across the world mostly i think mostly in the tropical regions okay this is a very interesting another example of parasitism so uh, what happens is so this is what it looks from the outside and if you cut it out this is what it looks like from the inside so this is an isopod which is marine dwelling crustacean and this is a fish mostly marine fish so what happens is this isopod once it infects a fish if it finds a host which is a fish it goes inside its mouth bites off its tongue eats off its tongue and then it becomes its living tongue so it just replaces the tongue whatever the fish has earlier eats it off and then simply attach itself to its to the mouth and then act itself as the tongue so that it can get you know uh, free food whenever the fish eats okay <clears throat> yeah there there are many weird examples of all these interactions that you see and this is much more weirder can someone describe what is this what kind of interaction this is or just the pictures interaction you might if you not heard of that completely fine but can you depict what the pictures are saying waspex you are asking me question in return when i ask you a question okay ठीक है something is better than nothing anybody else wants to comment what are these okay so 
Averatna, yes, you are right. The white structures that you're seeing are, you know, cocoons or pupae of wasps that have infected these caterpillars. And this talk, this is a case of parasitoidism. Okay. So here, a wasp comes. So what, hap what, what happens in here is, look here is the life cycle of you know a parasitoid wasp there are general predatory wasps that just eats the caterpillar but here what they do once if a wasp mates the female finds a caterpillar and then she injects some sometimes some viral particles and then uh, it's eggs eggs into the caterpillar along with the venom when well, it's thing is and then after that, the caterpillar just goes on doing its own business, and then eventually the egg will hatch, the, which the wasp has laid. It will grow into a big caterpillar. It will start feeding on the caterpillar from the insides, leaving those one of the important organs out, saving them for the end. Once it has devoured most of those organs, it will pop out. Okay, sometimes the host will be dead, but as you have seen in the previous example, the host is still alive. It depends on the size of the wasp also. And then the larva comes out, forms a cocoon and pupates, and then emerges as an adult. OK. So yeah. So not only wasps, there are a lot of flies also, dipterans also, that also that does this. Parasitoid that are involved, are involved in parasitoids. So the difference between parasitism and parasitoidism could be, uh, you know, the host here is kind of is dead, and it's not like predation where it just takes off all of them at the same instant, but it's somewhere in between, you know, parasitism, which the, doesn't necessarily kill. Most of the cases kill the host and predation where the host is immediately killed parasitoidism lies somewhere in between where you know the host will eventually die but it will take time for for it to be dead okay so that's all for the interactions some of the interactions that you see that but there are many more you know exceptions and weird examples that you get to see in nature okay and some of them we may not have even found it like the ones in deep sea ecosystems so colonies when you know functionally integrated aggregates formed by are basically defined as you know functionally integrated aggregates formed by the individuals of the same species so same species come together, different in, multiple individuals of the same species come together and then form functionally integrated aggregates. Of aggregates, you can call them as colonies. Like here is a case of, you know, case everyone knows is a corals. So there are multiple small, small individuals come together from, from this whole column. And societies. So in societies, uh, the interactions between different individuals happens for labor division and collaboration among individuals of this same species. So there are a lot of interaction that happens, but the ultimate aim or the thing that goes around in societies tends to be you know there is a division of labor and there is a collaboration between the individuals for doing a certain amount of tasks uh can someone think of uh some examples of societies where all do we see societies in animal world some examples are welcome Bees, termites, yes, ants, yes, another addition, honeybees, yes, those are all 
good examples and what about mammals do you think uh do mammals form societies yes no maybe no idea haven't heard okay anybody else have heard or same case so ants yeah, ants bees termites and then see uh, if you go by the definition that there is a labor division and collaboration among individuals to do certain tasks so there are societies that you can you can see in animals also so basically mammals also like for example in this case the meerkats they come together raise you know uh, to raise their eggs and ones take different parts you know watching watching out for the young ones or keep predators at bay or finding food so so there are you know mammal societies also you, you see but there are relatively less in number and we might not have he he heard them as popularly as we have met heard for like ants and bees uh elephant herds yes you can call them as you know small a small societies because they have this you know labor division or at least the collaboration among multiple individuals to do certain tasks like looking after the young one or finding food or protecting okay so is that the queen in the left picture no so there is this beautiful division of labor that happens in ants so both of them are of the same species and the left one is called a major worker and the small one is a minor worker okay so these are not the queens these are all workers but they differ in size okay so what are these things are written on what are they doing but what do these things generally depict what do you see what do you think when you see these you know pictures mating display yes both are mating display anybody else wants to add what this is so what 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 i was trying to i'm trying to depict so both are different taxa but they're trying to you know have similar sort of showing similar sort of you know behavior that behavior is mating or courtship display okay uh since we are come for behavior oh, sorry so what is ethology so that is what is written sorry for the way it is seen here can someone say what is ethology or define or think what is ethology study of animal behavior study of behavior scientific study of behavior of organisms yes you all are right so, so similarly like ecology where we study you know organisms and their environment ethology is like you study the behavior of okay and then ethogram what is an ethogram how is it different from you know ethology
record and pattern of behavior okay anybody else wants to add to it what is an ethogram or all of you just simply agree with what afia was saying that it just it's recording pattern of behavior okay so ethogram is something this measure of animal behavior yes so ethogram is nothing but it's a record of all the behaviors that the animal does okay uh for example let's go back to this example you know uh, if you take let's, let's talk about these birds let's say uh we start recording the behaviors for you know trying to document their courtship display so you are making a ethogram of these birds so there there are multiple steps let's say for example the birds come first they face each other is the first step second step they tap their feet third step they perform this step and then fourth step they do those those two things again repeatedly they tap and then they again does this step that's yours here so you can you know you can call all of this behaviors as a single behavior just as in a mating display or you can call each individual step like tapping your feet as you know one behavior and then the uh bobbing their heads back can the opening the beaks can be behavior number 2 and then third again they again repeat 2 and 3 again 2 and 3 again so the the number of behaviors it do or the type different types of behaviors it does is what you call ethogram here uh, it can be you know for facing each other tapping feet and then you know bending their heads backward and then calling out so these three are the behaviors that this species do as part of the mating display so then the ethogram consists of these three behaviors so that is what an ethogram represents okay uh hope you could understood understand sir what i was trying to convey here with respect to ethogram okay if not be, be patient with me uh, i will try to convey little ahead of the steps are behavior i'm not able to get or the courtship so the courtship is also a behavior if you want to look at everything as together but if you want to look at individual steps as different behaviors you can classify them as different behaviors so the whole courtship behavior has if you want to you know make a ethogram of the whole courtship behavior then each of the steps can be different behaviors but if you are just looking at you know whether it's foraging whether it's just sleeping or whether it's doing courtship display then each of these behaviors will be different behaviors that you will be record in an ethogram okay uh yes let's to so inventory or catalog of all the behaviors exhibited by the animal or animals whose behaviors behaviors are being studied the sort of trying to tell me uh so when you go out for doing behavior so you you know uh do it in different ways so there are two different main methods you try to document behavior so one is focal sampling the other one is scan sampling so if you look at this example it says scan sampling so what happens in scan sampling here an observer you know is looking at the at a herd of you know cheetal near to a water hole okay so the observer wants to document what all behaviors the species does at that point so the observer takes note down of where you are like you know where is the location where like water hole near to a watering hole which national park or whatever the area and then what's the time of the day and what's the weather so these kind of general observations are taken and then the observer starts observing each and every individual continuously let's say for example if it starts from the left 
you can just go, go through like this you know and then has to finish what each and every individual in the group okay so and then once he fin he has to write down what each individual is doing at the time he was observing so first he will start you know this individual is like he's standing second individual standing third individual sitting fourth individual standing fifth individual drinking water sixth individual eating seventh individual eating eighth individual sleeping something like that so you just go on watching each and every individual continuously okay so that is scan sample and then that basically you are scanning each and every individual in the group that you are looking at while in focal sampling you tend to focus on a single individual at a time and see what on different behaviors that animal do let's say you started you know let's say around two o'clock in the afternoon and you are you are making observing each individual for five every five for five minutes so for the first five minutes you observe this individual and then say so it started eating it walked a little bit and then again eating again walking standing fighting and then sitting so the five minutes are done so this individual is done so again then you move on to another individual and then or you might again watch the same individual okay uh so basically in focal and sampling you are concerned about a one individual at that specific type point of time unlike in scan sampling you are concerned about all of the individuals that you are trying to look at okay and so that the, these are the you know one of the many methods you use for doing behavioral observations so hope that was clear and moving on uh, this is a really interesting topic since we were talking about societies earlier so kin selection have anybody heard of what kin selection is and what does it try to say any idea about what kin selection is or we have never heard of it Okay, you may not have heard of the word kin selection, but you have seen kin selection in action or as an end product. So, going to the clumsy definition, so it, it says it's a process whereby natural selection selects for a trait uh, related to altruistic behavior, related to reproductive success. Yes, uh, you are. Absolutely right. So, what does it? What happens in kin selection is like uh, natural selection selects for a trait that such that the trait has to provide you know success to organisms' relatives at the cost of its own survival and reproduction. Okay. Uh, let's say. Uh, okay. Let's go with the examples in a little while. So this was originally this idea was you know this theory was originally put up by Hamilton and then subsequently his derivation of how it should work out in nature known to became as Hamilton's rule and then it plays a crucial role in the evolution of altruism and sociality. Okay, so I will ex explain how kin selection works in a while. So for now let's look at Hamilton's. So what does Hamilton say? Hamilton's rule say is basically it's a simple equation R into B should be greater than C. So R means relatedness, B benefits, and C R is the cost. So R is how so this is also interaction, right? In kin selection. If if you are interacting with some other individual, what is the relatedness you have with you know that individual? Let's say you have you are you are a and then there is another individual b okay if you are related to that person 
by you know 0.5 percent or 50 percent basically the person is your brother or sister or your basically your sibling so you are you know related to him by let's say 0.5 percent okay and the benefit of that interaction you say let's say is two okay but the cost associated with the interaction is three okay so if you multiply 0 0.5 into two is can some okay is one right right so one it has to be this is one greater than three no so basically uh the benefits are much more less compared to the cost interact cost occurred for, for the individual if it is you know in the interaction so uh yeah so the kin selection will not happen in this case for it to be happening either the relatedness should be higher or the benefits the individual receives should also be higher let's say if this is you know eight the benefit from the interaction he receives is eight then it will be four four is greater than eight, eight so then kin selection will take place in this exam okay uh hope i didn't confuse you with this example here so, so this is how you are related with your you know in at least in humans uh, how you will be related so if you are an actor of some sort of altruistic behavior and you are doing it you know half siblings basically you share just one parent so you are related to your parent by you know 0.5 percent because you share only half of your g half of your genes from one of your parent and half sibling you are you have just one parent as common and then the other recipient also shares only half of the genes from your parent so if you multiply 0 0.5 to 0.5 it's 0 0.25 okay so that is basically one fourth so that's how much you are related to the to your half sibling if you are providing some some uh some favor while if it's your own sibling then you are related by 0.5 percent how the same way like you share 0.5 percent of your genes with your mother and then 0.5 percent of your genes with your father and then so uh at any point you are you know at least half of your you share half of your genes with your sibling so you're much more related closely related to your siblings than half sibling and similarly it's you're very less related to you know your cousins because your parents share half percent with your uncle or aunt so the greater the r if you remember the thing again r b is greater than c so if you are the, if the relatedness is much more higher there is a high chance that this value will be positive or greater than c or the benefit should outweigh basically the benefit should much more outweigh the cost incurred during that Yeah. So what happens is at the end of you know if some of the traits are selected and it will lead to the evolution of you know altruistic behavior and then sociality in organisms. As you can see, insects have you know have a lot of evolved multiple times sociality 
like in case of ants, termites, and bees. But there are examples in mammals also, where like for this, for example, this is a naked mole rat, you know, that has uh, societies, basically are social, only one female gets to reproduce and all in this region and in the species. So what happens in these social organisms, at least in most of the insects, especially ants and bees, there is one individual that gets to reproduce. Okay, that is, you know, referred to as the queen. And then the other ones, other workers forego their reproduction. So basically they sacrifice the reproduction for the reproduction of, you know, their sisters or their mothers. And then they involve in, you know, taking care of the end ones that the in individual is laying. So, so that that foregoing of reproduction that you see in ants and bees has an advantage to the, you know, has a greater advantage to the, to the individual than the costs incurred by them to by you know by losing themselves the chance to reproduce so similarly as we have done this calculation there is you know much more much more complex calculation for ants and bees where these are haplodiploid main means uh only males have you know only half set of chromosomes they're haploid while females have two sets of chromosomes that is deployed so where in case of there is haplodiploidy, there is a high chances of, you know, there's a greater number of genes or relatedness between two different workers in the species. So that's how they gain, you know, much more reproductive advantage by foregoing their reproduction. And then that since that is beneficial to the, you know, whole colony as such, this new sociality has evolved in this group of insects okay hope uh, this this was a little clear okay i guess this consideration is only for reproductive success uh so for it to be, you know, because uh, it's, it's majorly compared in terms of reproductive success itself, because that's what at the end the animal tries to, you know, uh, that's what is the currency when you are looking at kin selection, because uh, it's, it's basically depends for most of the animals, it's how many individuals that you are offspring that you are leaving at the end of your, your life. So the more offspring you leave, you know, that greater is your success or reproductive success of you. But uh, the other way they can also do is since they share many of their genes, you know, much of their genes with, you know, the siblings or half siblings or cousins, they can also opt to, you know, uh, sacrifice themselves for, you know, for their half siblings or full siblings or cousins okay but for it to be successful the benefit they receive is should be greater than the cost incurred by them so for example in this case if you see here uh, let's go back to this example of uh, half siblings and full siblings okay for example uh, one of there is a person whose half whose sibling basically his brother or sister are drowning so for for him to you know take the risk and go and save them since they're related by you know uh only half so there is a cost you know let's say the cost is one and then benefit is also one okay for the if the relatedness is 0.5 the whole it will be 0.5 this side of the part so basically he has to you know at least if there are multiple many many more individual uh, most of his brothers let's say he has 
three brothers you know who are drowning so he has to save in you know, at least two of his three two or more than two of his brothers or sisters to be able to you know uh get benefit because at least he shares at least half of his genes with them so the number depends on the relatedness if if it if it's half siblings it just increase much more it's it's not just two it's much more higher okay <clears throat> explain can you explain the meerkat's altruistic behavior by this uh yes you can also explain this and yeah you can explain using kin selection meerkat's altruistic behavior as i think we can explain okay so so how one protects the whole group so in what happens in meerkats are you know let me just go back to the yes come back to the meerkats example so what happens in meerkats these are you know found in those desert regions mostly in the african subcontinent so uh when others are foraging near their burrows one or two individuals tends to stand on guard and then watch out for predators like snakes or birds which are you know eagles which are the normal predators for them or even for uh, mammals also so when once they see a predator they give an alarm call so that everyone gets you no know, gets on us you know know that there is a predator so they they should escape or you know if there is like predators that they can attack they will attack and then you know make them run so that's how each and each individual so each individual gets to do certain job sometimes the individual who is on watch has to change like sentry so yeah hope that answered what you are asking but some of them sacrifice for the herd then how can i value the relatedness so what happened so mo- at least in most of these uh, you social organisms they are related mostly they are related to each other either they are sisters let's say for example in ants each both these ants are sisters to each other so they have certain sisters in ants have you know 0.75% related to each other because half of the genes already come directly f- from father as such while in meerkats it might vary but since they are related to each other they are willing to uh, sacrifice themselves you know for the betterment of the colony so even if they end up dying since there are some of the genes that this individual has that it is shared upon by other individuals so that it can be uh, propagated in the population okay. how it is related to fitness of the species uh it's uh, can you just which thing can you just please explain what you're trying to ask you like fitness of the species and which thing is related to the fitness of the species you are asking is it relatedness or something else okay. theory of natural selection so that's an interesting case right so in social you social organism kin selection happens okay where in you know that trait gets selected it's not you know it's not just a species the species the traits in the species get selected that you know at the end has a greater survival uh, advantage for 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 the species in terms of you know 
uh, ability to share its genetic component. Okay. Uh, however, natural selection is the fittest, fit, the survival of the fittest. Right? You can also call it as. But here, it's it's not just that individual. It's how it is shared across. Hope it was little clear at least, or you are still confused. So our theory of natural selection might not entirely explain, you know, that you see in uh, social organisms. Okay. You understood Rajeshree. Usation is cooperative, whereas natural selection is based on competition. Uh, yes, usation is, you know, eusocial organisms are totally social organisms. And then there is, you know, there is a cooperation between individuals or the species that happens. Uh, it's okay, type, type two errors happens. So, whereas natural selection is based on competition, uh, it's not necessarily competition for with respect to natural selection. It's whichever is you know in natural selection. If you remember, it's, it's called the survival of the fittest. Whichever is fit for that environment will survive. It's not based on competition. It's based upon you know how well each uh, that organism or the species is suited for the environment. You know to how the maximum reproductive success, which is basically what natural selection tends to say about, while use social, use sociality is a little different term, where you know cooperation happens between different individuals of the same species because they are related, and then there are some uh, some benefits they get from being involved in the sociality. And most of these social organisms tends to have loss, or at least they are willing to lose their reproductive ability for, for the you know, for the reproductive ability, and working for one allowing one individual in the so society to you know to reproduce. Let's you know, like the example of bees or ants or the naked mole rat, where one one individual or the queen gets to reproduce while others. May not get the opportunity to reproduce at all. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any more questions? Because if we are done as of now, I think I don't have any more to add. Okay. Cool. So, hope this 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 discussion has you know helped you in understanding some of those concepts. Yeah. In which case. Yeah, I think we can stop here, stop the recording.